Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each episode we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we are talking about Gladiator, directed by Ridley Scott, screenplay by David Franzoni, John Logan, and William Nicholson. I'm joined by part of the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. And also joining us today are fellow video essayists and podcasters, Tom Vinderlinden, who you may know from his YouTube channel, Like Stories of Old. Uh, hello. Thanks for having me. And Thomas Flight, who you may know from his YouTube channel, Thomas Flight. Hi, happy to be here. Excellent. Yes, welcome to the show. We're very excited to have you guys here. We've been scheduling this for a long time, and I'm glad yep. we finally made this happen. We have several patrons that uh, are big fans. Kalki, shout out. So I think there, there are going to be people that are very excited to that we have you guys here. Nice. Um, so uh, before we dive into Gladiator, uh, for our listeners, I want to say that our next episode is going to be on Alien, the original Alien, which I've now realized, Trisha, that we accidentally did a Ridley Scott trilogy. I here. know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little embarrassing that we didn't even think about it. Yeah. But what a trilogy it is. Indeed. We just talked about Thelma and Louise, and so now we're talking about Gladiator and then Alien. Um, yeah, so everyone prepare yourselves for that. Um, okay, so also before we dive into Gladiator, so Tom, Thomas, uh, you guys have a podcast, Cinema of Meaning. What, mm -hmm. what made you want to start a podcast? Who are you? If I'm a new listener, TLDR, tell me about yourselves and, and what your podcast is about. Yeah, so Cinema of Meaning is for everyone who wants to go even further beyond the screenplay. <laughs> oh! <laughs> down. We're, we're so far beyond the screenplay, we barely wow. talk about it at all. But. <laughs> nice. I see. <laughs> Uh, no, but we we obviously are big fans of uh, Beyond the Screenplay, and we thought it would be a fun format for ourselves as well, um, just because we've been doing video essays on our own, and we've been looking for something to do together, because it's, it's just uh, more fun, and uh, especially the conversational format is, uh, for me at least, really helpful to really trigger like new ideas and to really dive into a movie. And so, yeah, that's basically the setup of Cinema of Meaning. We talk about a movie each week and we really try to focus on the deeper themes, the deeper meanings. So we have a bit more of a philosophical or like thematic um, angle to it. And yeah, it's been uh, lots of fun. Yeah. Yeah, because it's also a very conversational show, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I listened to it for the first time. I was like, oh, this is like very like natural and organic and i feel like anyone that likes beyond the screenplay is going to like cinema of the meaning and and vice versa um yeah and it is a lot of thematic analysis which yeah. is the best which is great <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if it's a good way to make a podcast but it, it's funny to me how quickly like it stopped being a podcast in my head and just like my time for talking with uh tom about movies so uh if nobody was <laughs> listening i think i'd still want to do it i just I really uh, enjoy the the conversations we have. So mm -hmm. uh, it's fun to be able to share those with people. Yeah, for sure. I think that's kind of what Beyond the Screenplay has become also. It's just like, let's hang out. Let's talk about movies. Especially when we all go see a movie like Jurassic World Dominion and we need to debrief and vent <laughs> or whatever whatever the case may be. Um, okay, so, so let's dive into Gladiator. So I had not seen... Gladiator. I had seen parts of it, but I never sat down and watched it like start to finish when it came out. I think I was like 14 and wasn't allowed to like watch R-rated movies, but I remember hearing about it and like Russell Crowe's so great and all this stuff. But I also kind of assumed it was just going to be like violence and like hyper masculinity and killing people and didn't expect it to have this, which is which it has, uh, <laughs> but I wasn't expecting it to have this like rich story and it's so well told and, and uh, yeah, just it's a beautiful, powerful, moving film that I was really like, I was sad that I hadn't seen it until recently uh, because there's so many things in here that are really good. Weirdly, there were some like comparisons to Thelma and Louise that were happening in my brain since we just talked about Thelma and Louise as another Ridley Scott movie. But uh, yeah, I really, really loved it. Um, 
Trisha, I want to hear from you your thoughts, and then Thomas and Tom, let's hear why why you guys want to talk about Gladiator. But yeah, Trisha, Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts? Yeah, I saw Gladiator back in the day. It would have not been in theaters. Um, But I remember, you know, it's it's a long movie. It's like kind of the pinnacle of this period epic story that we, you know, we had a few of those um, in the 90s and they were like the big prestige award movies. And so this is like the big time, I don't know, everybody saw Gladiator, everybody loves Gladiator, nominated for 12 Oscars, it won five Oscars, it was just like the big movie. I like it, I think it's great. Um, I want to get into the themes and I'm so glad we have Thomas and Tom on to talk about the, the thematic stuff and the character arc and the journey. Um, mm-hmm. cause I think, uh, it's a little bit messy <laughs> and, um, even though it's a very simple story, I feel like what's going on on like a deeper level is sometimes, uh, gets a little muddy. And I, I think that that in itself is interesting. Um, for a story that's kind of simplistic and a character also that's a little simple um, with Maximus. And we don't have to get too much into the screenwriting, but the more that I've learned about the screenwriting, the more that it kind of illumines like what was happening because the screenwriting process was also messy. <laughs> um, I was watching it this time and the credits popped up and you can see the names of the writers on the screen and there's like four of them or whatever. And you're like, oh, that's a few. Um, and you, you get that sense, I think when you watch it, but yeah, it's amazing performances. It's like this huge sweeping adventure with a huge sweeping adventure score (laughs) by Hans Zimmer. Um, and yeah, it's like, there's, there's kind of nothing better at this kind of movie than Gladiator, I think. So very excited to dive in more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Tom, tell me about Gladiator. I did saw Gladiator when I was really young and so I've, I've pretty much loved it ever since. I, I almost can't imagine having missed it because it was just, uh, it was the go-to movie on television for the big movie night or movie Monday or whatever they had. Um, but yeah, over the years it's remained a, for me at least, a perfect integration of spectacle and action and especially violent action into a meaningful story and there is some messiness there but i think it works ultimately but yeah that's just a lot about the way the movie seems to comment on itself and obviously with the gladiator fights there's uh, you have maximus fighting in front of this audience and there's also us as the audience of that audience and Maximus. So there is that kind of meta aspect to the whole movie. Um, But I think it tackles it in a very interesting way and uh, also in a way that I just haven't seen a lot since. It's, uh, there's something about it that's extremely difficult to pull off, I think. And uh, yeah, I look forward to get into that in more detail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool, all right, and Thomas? There's something about this kind of movie and a lot of what I'm saying will probably overlap with what you guys have already said, but um, it's kind of a little bit of like a bygone uh, icon of like a bygone era of filmmaking, not just in terms of subject matter, but in like the style of story and um, the fact that this was just like a screenplay that was commissioned by like DreamWorks and then like they got Ridley Scott to make this and it's like... This kind of movie doesn't really exist in this way anymore, it feels like. Um, so it's it's interesting to watch that. Also, in terms of the approach to storytelling, weirdly, like this time watching it, I thought of um, RRR, which I just watched recently, <laughs> which is mm-hmm. like way more over the top than this. But watching this, uh, having just seen RRR recently, um, which is a really, you know, ex- very over the top Hollywood um, film for those who aren't familiar with it. I was like feeling that that just like the immense sincerity of this kind of story with like there's moments where, you know, there's just epic line, you know, it's like the whole movie is like and now the hero is going to say this epic line and you're just going to be like, yeah, it's like that <laughs> kind of sincerity, like I, I feel like is not. It is rare is rare these days. Um, so it's it's interesting. Like it feels like an artifact from from a different era of filmmaking. 
Um, so that on top of everything else that everybody else mentioned and like, like Tom, I thought a lot about the, the like weird interplay of like, it's a, ultimately a, a story about entertainment and it's a piece of entertainment. And that just adds this interesting, you know, film to everything. Uh, so yeah, very excited to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was listening to your guys' episode about Top Gun Maverick, and I think you guys were identifying something that I was feeling also, just like like you're saying, Thomas, this sincerity and just this genuine, non-cynical, we're just going to make a movie and go all the way and like be earnest about each moment. Uh, and I, yeah, I was also feeling that in, in Gladiator and, and missing it and missing stories like this and even the character arc, you know, it's very tragic the you know him maximus losing his family but that's a gr huge motivator and like spoiler alert he dies in the end like we don't we don't have stories that feel like they that go to those extreme places and anymore it feels like you have to kind of play it a little bit safer or if it's a marvel movie there's less uh, you know well because if the main character dies michael how are you going to make five sequels that's the real question, although <laughs> there is some talk of Gladiator 2. There was a really fascinating script for a sequel apparently a few years ago. It was called Christ Killer, and it's, it's, it's absolutely wild apparently, but I, I highly doubt that's the one they're going to make. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I would assume it would be a, a spiritual sequel and not a literal sequel. Um, some people make it out of this movie that could be in a sequel to it. Yeah, fair. Yeah. So the the literal sequel they had there was a uh, the short story of it is that uh, Maximus is sent to the afterlife and then apparently all the gods live there and Jesus is among them. But then uh, once the old Roman gods they start to notice that Jesus is getting too popular back on Earth, they send Maximus to kill Jesus and his followers and. Apparently, it turns out into this really strange uh, trickery of the gods thing where Maximus ends up being turned into this eternal warrior. And apparently, there was this long sequence with him fighting in every war that's ever happened since. And yeah, I, I can imagine it wasn't well, made. <laughs> yeah. But it's a well, fascinating, uh, fascinating story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's more interesting than I yeah, would have expected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have a great idea. Maybe it's for a narrative, maybe it's for a video essay, maybe it's a music video, it could be anything. The question then becomes, how do you visualize it? How do you communicate it to a collaborator and create buy-in? And how do you do all of that in a cost-effective way? Storyblocks is a royalty-free stock library that makes it possible for creators to keep up with the growing demands for modern video content so you can bring all your stories to life and stop sacrificing your vision due to time, budget, or resources. Unlike traditional stock sites that limit content with a pay-per-clip model, Storyblocks gives you unlimited downloads, so you can create more. They have images and illustrations, audio and sound effects, and high-quality video and video templates. And Storyblocks has a selection of flexible subscriptions, so you can focus on creating instead of worrying about budget. To check out Storyblocks and sign up for their unlimited all-access plan, head to storyblocks.com slash beyond the screenplay. Once again, that's storyblocks.com slash beyond the screenplay. The link is also in the show notes. Thanks to Storyblocks for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. Well, yeah, so why don't we we kind of dive into the themes? It seems like there's a lot of thematic conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I'd be curious to even hear, like, from all of you guys, maybe starting with you, Trisha, of like, yeah, what do, what do we think the film is saying thematically? Because this is one of those movies where sometimes when a movie is too good, it's bad for the podcast, for me and the podcast, because I end up just, like, watching the movie and being engrossed in it and not thinking about it. So I haven't done a lot of, like, analysis of, of it and the thematic content. But as Tom and Thomas, you guys are bringing up, there is this kind of meta level of we're watching, we're audience watching audience. It's about the power of the mob. They say that a lot. And, like, you know, Rome is the, the mob and those kinds of things. Um, but, yeah, so, I'm, yeah, curious... Trisha, what are some of the kind of thematic elements that you were picking up in this? I mean, some of the most obvious 
have to do with like power, right? And the consolidation mm-hmm. of power in one person and the, versus like the Republic, right? And so like, the idea is that the Senate, um, you know, Marcus Aurelius wants to return power to the Senate and, to restore this dream that was Rome. Um, and that Commodus is trying to hang on to power uh, for selfish reasons, right? Because he feels impotent <laughs> because his father never loved him and he's not that much of a man. He's not as much of a man as Maximus is, right? His sister always was in love with Maximus instead of him. <laughs> and <laughs> there's that conversation that's happening kind of in the larger overarching structure and story of it. Um, I think that the theme that interests me the most is mm-hmm. the one that you touched on earlier, Tom, about entertainment and where Mm -hmm. sort of like responsibility lies in entertainment of the entertainer and the relationship between them and the audience, right? There's the Coliseum is obviously sort of the most heightened, bloodthirsty, like, you know, worst of humanity, like our, our impulses to watch, you know, death and violence in the Coliseum. Um, And I think I wish the movie interrogated that a little more, Right. It's really interesting. Oliver Reed's character, Proximo, who I love in this, he is the one who kind of speaks into that theme most where he's like, if you win the audience, you're going to win your freedom. So you need to entertain them. You need to be an entertainer. And that's kind of actually his last like moment where he says, like, I'm an entertainer. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wish that there was kind of more of that in the movie. Um, The audience in this is kind of faceless. And we see some push and pull where um, Commodus feels like he can't, you know, just have Maximus killed um, because of the power of the mob, as you're talking about. But where that falls with, like, our impulse as, like, spectators or voyeurs, I think is not as clear. And then none of that has anything to do with the revenge arc plot line, really, uh, which is, you know, I I think that Maximus is like journey is a like probably the weakest of all of these three themes or it just kind of gets lost in the other ones where it's like he just wants to be with his family again and he decides that he's going to fulfill the responsibility of serving Rome that Marcus Aurelius like asked him to do um that's kind of the big arc for him but there isn't a lot of, it doesn't feel like there's a ton of internal work going on on the character where he starts off with one clear thesis and then like swings to it. It doesn't feel like there's that traditional big arc hero's journey. Here's the way he sees the world. And then it goes at a, under a total transformation. Not true for Maximus, um, which is not to say that, again, the movie isn't interesting, just that it's got a few different themes going on that kind of like don't always perfectly picture puzzle piece together. But we have two thematic experts sitting right here. (laughs) Yeah. I was thinking, uh, first of all, uh, I think a lot of the issues with Proximo's character is that the actor, uh, Oliver Reed, he passed away before they completed filming. So they had to rewrite some elements of the script to fit him in. Because I I actually, it wasn't until today that I read that uh, the fight that Maximus has against the veteran gladiator was supposed to be proximo in an original script so i'm not sure how that would have played out but i think there would have been more of that interrogation maybe if they had been able to complete that original vision and not uh yeah. kind of cut it off half halfway through as to maximus's journey i actually really liked the way his personal story is the macro story as well there's the his personal vendetta kind of aligns with the quest that Rome as a whole is on to find some kind of justice. Um, and I'm not sure he was supposed to have like a, I'm not sure it would have fitted if he had like a big transformation arc, because you can have sure. like these static character arcs, because it's more the, uh, the world around Maximus that changes and is changed eventually because of his presence. And I, that's something that I really like the way he uh, really starts at the lowest level as a slave and then slowly he earns the respect of like the, the, the fellow gladiators of the um the public and eventually even of uh some of commodus's lieutenants or generals the uh and, and the supposed enemies and in that sense it's actually his 
uh, non-transformation that makes that that sets the world into motion, which I thought was really interesting. And uh, I'm just personally a big fan of such character arcs where it's actually not the main character that changes, but the world around them. Um, kind of like Batman, maybe, or uh, Hacksaw Ridge was a, an obvious example of that. I, I agree that it's the way he starts out with actually ha or uh, almost having like a death wish and then setting out on revenge and then only then setting out to fulfill Marx Aurelius's final wish that's a bit muddled as to when exactly he's motivated by which uh reason or motivation exactly so uh, but yeah i think uh marcus or uh maximus's character arc is strength and point a strength and honor Point B, point C, strength and honor. It's like, <laughs> you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is this kind of like interesting, as you're saying, Tom, but the, it's a very flat character arc where he is changing the world and changing the minds. I think to to your point, Trisha, it's interesting that there are, like the way he's doing that is through entertainment, as we've said, and like through the mob. And I feel it feels like there are moments when the movie has an opinion on like is that good or bad and there are moments where maximus you know when the idea is kind of first like suggested to him of like win the crowd and blah 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 uh that it seems like he's disinterested or kind of maybe even disgusted by the idea i don't know it's it's very subtle so that might be projecting there um mm -hmm. but it is interesting kind of like you were just uh saying that like there's and any given moment, his motivations don't always like aren't always crystal clear, and how he feels about having to perform basically to s sway the mob to do what needs to be done. Um, yeah, it's just interesting in that it isn't really interrogated, like you're saying, too much in in the film. Yeah, I mean, an obvious and bad way to do it, I think, would be to start off, you know, having Maximus go like. I hate gladiators. I think it's bloodthirsty and wrong. And like, I think it's the worst thing about Rome and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and then have to go through the process of like, maybe there is something here, but maybe th whatever. No one wants that. Um, and so, you know, my observation that the themes aren't super in clear conversation with each other is not necessarily a critique. I just want to clear that up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, and I do think it makes it, um, sort of the diffuse like nature of these different themes playing together makes those couple moments you pointed out just now, Michael, when they do come into like super sharp focus, you know, those moments really sing. And I think that's part of the reason that some of those moments are the most iconic in it, right? Obviously the most famous one in it is, are you not entertained? Um, and that's all of those different things kind of coming together. Um, and so I, I think that under the circumstances, you're trying to tell this huge story. Um, and there are really interesting themes in it. And the plot itself is so compelling. And the action itself is so riveting. And like everything about it, so well shot, the filmmaking, Russell Crowe's performance, that like you only need a few of those little things to feel like you're being told a story that has like crystal clear themes and depth. And there's enough in it that I think it can be mined in the way that we're doing now for the where these things pop up. I think that's a great point because where the movie really sings for me is that all this stuff, a lot of what we've been talking about so far, is kind of like the setup that sets these really high stakes for these moments where then it's like the the actual conflict of the movie is almost always being resolved within like a these fights that are set up. And so there's this relationship where you have conflict between these two characters that are both drawing their power from like their ability to entertain and they're in conflict, but they need the, the mob on their side. Like even, even Maximus being set up as this like incredible warrior, like at the end, his success is more in like the fact that the soldiers surrounding him Kind of get on his side and they're like they don't give a sword to the commodus yes yeah. commodus and, and it's like he you can you can kind of read through that that like he would have lost if he hadn't like won those guys to his side so it's not really his individual strength that ultimately like wins him it's the fact that these people have decided to side with him so we see that conflict 
set up in all these scenes and then it, where it actually plays out is like in the combat which i think is an it sets up this very nice mirror where like we're experiencing the the stakes that like the audience would be experiencing as we're watching it and we're like what's you know what's going to happen who's going to win uh and that like that to me hits on where is where it, it operates really well as like a movie because you get to like see the conflict play out instead of just like you know that it's being resolved through exposition or somebody saying something somewhere. Yeah. It also adds so much significance to the way the action is performed and the way the violence is kind of displayed, because that's something that I feel is missing from a lot of action movies. Still, uh, a lot of, I think most movies understand that when you have an action scene, it needs to result in some sort of change, but that usually only means like a change in the plot, like the, like some character will have an object, there'll be a chase scene and they'll lose the object or something like that. Um, but I feel what makes Gladiator so fascinating is that it's not just the outcome of an action scene that matters, but also the way it is performed, because that's something they set up quite early on when Maximus goes in for the first time, he kind of kills them all, kills all the enemies sort of unceremoniously. And then they're like, no, you don't, that's not the right way to do it. You have to there needs to be a performative element to that, which um, also kind of plays out in the way the movie depicts its own violence. And uh, in that way, to me at least, gives uh, makes it a lot more meaningful than just watching a action scene waiting for it to play out and see how what kind of outcome is achieved. Yeah, it's really interesting. We used some clips from Gladiator when we were doing a video about like a final battle and like the construction of a battle scene in, in screenwriting. And I was thinking a lot about that because we were, we talked a lot about like containment and boundaries and stakes, right? And so like to create a compelling battle, you have to have really clear boundaries to the battlefield and clear rules that the characters have to follow. And, you know, we used that kind of rule or those ideas to talk about the final, um, like courtroom scene in a few good men. And we were drawing parallels between this and that, which is a totally different kind of battle. Right. But gladiator is one of the best ever because the fights are super contained. There are really clear boundaries and rules and it's to the death basically every time. So the stakes couldn't possibly be higher. And so it's just an amazing construction for drama because as a screenwriter, all you're trying to do is the work that's basically done for you in Gladiator um, in the easiest way possible. And so it's just, you, you know, Gladiator just does it. It's like lock them together. The stakes are high. Here you go. And then you can just focus, as you're pointing out, Tom, on the nature of how the battle unfolds. And it's always going to be compelling. Like that's mm -hmm. all we need for it to be compelling. Yeah. Yeah. I think the like highlighting the so yeah, as you're saying, Trisha, like the, the stakes are clear, the boundaries are there, the rules are set. And then like you're saying, Tom, that so much of the focus is on the how the battle plays out. And like you were saying, Thomas, there's like the the antagonist and the protagonist are fighting kind of indirectly via the crowd, right? Like they're using, it's all mm -hmm. about who can perform and manipulate the crowd and that's what gives them that power. And so it is all focused down, like all those things collapse onto each battle such that each battle is full of meaning and exciting and compelling, not just because it's swords and action, but because of every moment that happens, you know, will have a consequence. And I think that's all these things are really identifying why these battle scenes are super compelling in a way that your average action movie or a different kind of, you know, swords and sandals fight might be cool to look at, but doesn't have the emotional grip that each fight has in Gladiator. Yeah. I think also the way we tend to talk about action nowadays is very divorced from the what the actual story needs. Like when you ask someone on YouTube, uh, for example, like what's a good action scene that they'll talk about uh, wide angles, like everything has to be clear, it has to be like not shaky. Um, but Gladiator actually doesn't really abide by those rules. It's had some more, it's has a much more visceral uh, depiction of violence, which I think fits better to serve this particular story. 
But when you compare it for to uh, like 300, for example, or especially the 300 sequel, which has that really stylized f- violence without really having a story reason for that violence to be so stylized. Um, so that's something I thought was really interesting too about Gladiator. It's it's not trying to depict the violence in the most pretty way, but it's trying to go for that ultimate emotional response. Um, you can uh, see that I think the clearest in the uh, I think it was called the Battle of Carthage, the the, the middle, the big centerpiece uh, before the midpoint where uh, Maximus is fighting in the Colosseum with his buddies against the 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 other the bad guys on the chariots, so to say, and there's just so many layers of for one ha- having them play out a battle scene that they're supposed to lose. So on that level, there's already that subversion of history that's happening through their own like cooperation and their uh, Maximus re- reclaiming the, his role as a leader again, and just the way it's performed it, with the music, it's like really triumphant when. Maximus wins that one and at the end he does his big performative like we won and it's a clear difference from also from the way he started out as a gladiator and it's more comparable to the way he did his initial battle scene in which that feeling of brotherhood was more naturally expressed but he had you can argue to what extent it is performative or to what extent he's genuinely uh cheering like for having achieved an almost impossible victory and i just love the way the action is uh, performed in this uh, movie yeah one thing i think you just touched on there tom mm-hmm. that i forgot to mention completely when i was talking about themes that i think is one of the most interesting ones in here is the theme of leadership mm. and what leadership looks like right um and in in this particular case it's very like you know, war, you know, you know, sort of martial masculine leadership. But I think the movie is hugely about that. Although it's not often addressed in like the dialogue of the characters other than like people saluting Maximus all the time because no one can help but, but salute him. He's such a leader. Mm-hmm. But I think that that is a, a really big part of the conversation about, um, you know, it's about succession in the sense of, who is going to be the leader of Rome. Um, You know, there's that, I mentioned the theme of power that's in there, but I think the theme of leadership is even a more interesting one. Um, And I wish, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear what you guys think about it because it's where it pops up. the, The first battle in Germania is the one where it's like he is the leader they will follow him anywhere they will follow him to the death for sure um and the way that he talks to his Mm -hmm. men there and then it gets all the way you know we see he wants to be no one he wants to be nothing he scrapes the tattoo off he cuts the tattoo off of his shoulder he doesn't want to be a leader um and isn't it it's um Lucilla, it's, she says, you know, he's like, I absolutely don't want to do this. And she's like, that's why you have to be the one to do it. Right. There's this idea that the, this sort of humble leader who doesn't want to be a leader is going to be the best leader all the way through to all the other gladiators will like die for him, um, in the courtyard when the Praetorian guards come. So, uh, very curious to hear your guys' thoughts on that. I definitely have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> you can go first, Tom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what this movie really does quite well is connect the issue of leadership to the issue of vision and a collective vision that a leader mm. presents to a society and the way maybe a leader gives shape to what is seen by the people as their collective identity. And I think that there might be a bit of a contradiction there at the end, but I think the way it is set up especially is... Uh, I love the way after the first gladiator fight where uh, Maximus is first introduced to the arena and then the moment the battle is over, he really starts to notice the crowd for the first time and you get that really Michael Bay-ish shot where the camera pans around them real fast and then it uh, transitions into this scene where Commodus enters back into Rome and it is this really like this big music, big visuals and... It, but to me, it actually invoked um, a kind of triumph of the will kind of spectacle. The you know the mm. the Hitler propaganda film in which there's these 
huge buildings, these huge monuments, and Garment is riding in victoriously. And, and, and I think at that point, the movie really communicates kind of the dangers of spectacle in this in the way it can be this thing of grandeur and grandiosity and just violence for entertainment, with, with which later comes with the Gladiator games. But um, I think the challenge of the movie was then to have, to kind of subvert the idea that this kind of spectacle is bad while also still portraying a movie that has that kind of spectacle just in the sense that it's entertaining and so the way it kind of does that i think is that it has maximus kind of reappropriating the spectacle into a more um democratic it's it, it wasn't exactly a democracy but a more liberating ideal i think instead of a tyrannical one so i think that's kind of what the movie tries to suggest maybe that it's not spectacle as uh, oppression and sedation but more spectacle as a sense of defiance and revolution that ultimately is what kind of stokes the fire to bring down commodus and restore rome to that original vision that's more uh, more about the people more about the senate more about the boring work of uh, having an having a society that actually that actually provides services and security and things to its people instead of just uh, deludes them with these illusions of grandeur and spectacle and that sort of stuff. Mm. Yeah, all of which I was disturbed by how relevant it felt. Uh, mm. Also, this yeah. idea of yes. leaders that are great at putting on a show and maybe not mm. great at. Leading. actually leading yeah <laughs> tom summarized that so well i don't i don't know uh how much i could add but yeah I, I i'm totally on the same page with you michael where watching this i was like just the feeling the weight of that connection between leadership and and entertainment and how like there's in a sense like we don't we don't want it to be like I've, I've been thinking about what this what this movie is saying in in regards to this, um, because to me, it doesn't feel like it has like this clear like thesis of I mean, I think Tom is making a good point towards like show showcasing Maximus as more of a um, spirit of like rebellion and revolt, like he's pushing directly mm -hmm. back against the um, against the emperor, although like there's some sense in which like. I think this is where maybe to your point, Trisha, it gets a little messy in that like the the theme of revenge there kind of like muddies like what's going on with his character and like what he's right. trying to accomplish and why. Um, so yeah, there's I, I have trouble like feeling out like does this movie have a thesis about like what does entertainment mean within this context of leadership and uh, and that kind of stuff. And I I don't know that there's a clear one that I could get a handle on by that I get a handle on by the end of the film of like, oh yes, you know, we, ha we have to be careful about this. Um, but, but just seeing it depicted in this way, I think it's in a diff in such a different context from our own. Um, I think is, it it's just a good, uh, it, like way of entering into like feeling that relationship of like, oh yes, how our our ability to get caught up in something or be entertained or entertainment the way entertainment like increases scope like of someone's actions or someone's behavior uh like if you can do something and like a few people see it on a battlefield it's like okay you've influenced like the people directly around you but then if you do it on in a stadium and like all these thousands of people see you then suddenly you have a cultural movement or something um, and so, you know, even, even and, and maybe Tom, you disagree or, or maybe, uh, you d disagree that there is a thesis here by the end. Um, I don't, I, I couldn't really find that, but I think even just mm -hmm. entering into that space, uh, of feeling that relationship and having that reminder of like, these things are kind of difficult to, to pull apart, like leadership and entertainment and we don't really want it to like we can be like mm, that's 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 not good that's not how it should be 
but like it's not it's not easy to separate those we can't just be like well it's not good so that's not how it is it's like you know and then you're watching this and you're like oh it's cool because they're fighting and they're gladiators and so then you're mm. getting caught up in it too and you're like mm, you know i don't know it's like very difficult to untangle yeah uh, that, that's actually why i like that the movie doesn't uh have a resolution that goes like oh no spectacle is bad and we shouldn't do it ever and at the same time, <laughs> still present a very spectacular While movie. While still so being I, a mo movie, though, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I, I like that it, it, it's honest enough to know that spectacle and entertainment and all that stuff is a part of our society, and however you play it out. So I like that it tries to find some resolution within the boundaries instead of have this really obvious moralistic message at the end that... It's hard to apply to an actual real life situation, but, um, but yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. And, and I think kind of like to your point, Thomas, and kind of what everyone's been saying that it, I think there, this movie raises these ideas, makes you think about it, presents it in a context that is, you know, not our lives and not about us. And so you can engage with it a bit more. And that's why I think that thematic element of leadership and performance kind of snuck up on me. Uh, we're halfway through, I was like, oh, this is extremely relevant. Like nothing about the details of what's happening here is, but like this idea of, um, yeah, the performance and, and what you said earlier, Tom, I thought was really great of the, this like spectacle and performance as like a leadership tool to create an identity of a people like, there's so much power in that. And you see that happening in this. And the Maximus is like using spectacle in a, uh, yeah, a more positive way, I guess, right? Where like for a while he's like uh, Maximus the merciful because he doesn't kill the person. Like he's defying these things and breaking the rules, but within the specific context. So it's, that's where, yeah, these ideas of like rebellion and all that stuff comes comes from. But it's showing how you can use this power to create a different identity, right? Like a different dream for Rome than uh, what Commodus is using it for. And specifically also the, the, the tools of oppression, because the irony is, is that if Commodus hadn't held these gladiator games, then Maximus would still be on the outskirts of in Africa somewhere and he would not have been able to to rise through the ranks, so to say, and and overcome Commodus at the end. So that there's a bit of irony there. Um, I'm not sure what to make of that, but um, just thought it was interesting to point out. Yeah. One thing that I I think is kind of driving all of this, or or is just happening under the surface, all of this that I think is super smart screenwriting, also is the fact that um, Maximus has nothing to lose. And he like it, you know, be the choice to take away his entire family is super dark. <laughs> I was not, I was like, oh yeah, they're just going to kill that very small child from life is beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he made it out of a concentration camp and you're just going to, okay. Anyway, but uh, that choice at the beginning to really take everything away from him, his farm, he loves his wheat so much. His harvest is always ready. So many like, hands through the wheat. <laughs> Yeah. Just going to touch the earth and all the <laughs> plants. Um, but by stripping the character, like everything away that the character might care about, it allows him to be um, a, like a, a tool to be used by the movie, like in a way that, you know, abandons. We talked about his motivations being muddy. They are. But it's it abandons sort of the need for like we need to know in every scene what his motivation is we don't he's got nothing to lose and people are trying to kill him constantly so it just kind of makes him into this like blunt instrument that he can just kind of bash his way through this movie and drive the plot forward in a way that we can just enjoy watching and that's not to say sorry that makes it sound like 
as that that disregards all of the elegantly put together thematic work that we're kind of discussing. Um, but from a character design standpoint, it's just a smart way to go because we don't need to be able to parse like, why is he not trying to save his own life in this scene? Like, why isn't he more cautious? Why isn't he mm -hmm. worried about what his performance is saying to the people? He, We don't have to wonder any of that because he's just a man with nothing to lose. And so like... Except, and all he wants is to kill Commodus. Um, maybe he does want more than that, but boil it down and there's enough to drive him through every single scene. And you can pick what you think his motivation is at any given moment, but you don't need to know it exactly or be able to put a fine point on it. I I agree with you, Trisha, that I think like we, we're talking about deeper themes here. And I think those things are like in the movie enough that it's very interesting to talk about them and it has some interesting things to illustrate and say, but I would say like, to your point, why the movie works as like an, an, a movie, an entertaining movie is much more basic than that. It's like, not because it's a commentary on entertainment and leadership. Like it works because it sets up these characters. It kind of puts them on a path. There's, there's conflict and you're, you're, you get to watch it, you know, uh, you know, I was thinking about how like there, you spend a good, like 45 minutes of setup in this movie that really sets the characters on a path. And then, you know, you, you like, you know, like these guys are going to come head to head again, and we're going to have to resolve this somehow. And it takes it, it really takes its time and getting to that place, but because it does that setup and because you kind of know the inevitability of like what needs to happen, you, you know, you feel that conflict and, um, and like at its core, it's, it's operating in a much more basic way. For sure. I noticed this time around, that one little scene in Germania where Commodus is fighting with his trainers and mm -hmm. how much setup work that is doing. <laughs> like Chekhov's we, Commodus kind of Chekhov's moment. Commodus <laughs> sword fight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just how much basic screenwriting work that is doing. Because we are never going to see Commodus. All we're going to do is see him sitting around in palaces, scheming, walking around, being creepy at everybody, and just be constantly being worried about what's going on that he doesn't know about. But we're never going to see him fighting. But if you need to have him fighting Maximus at the end, we have to have that scene. And I do wonder when I saw it this time, I was like, it really waves a banner for me right now of like, here we are. Commodus <laughs> also can swing a sword. <laughs> Notice it. But effectively, right? So by the time Commodus gets in the ring with Maximus, you're like, oh, he also can wave a sword. I saw him do it. Yeah. I think that training scene also sets up his character so well as someone who mm. has this extensive training scene right after the battle and right uh, like he's set up as this person who who knows of combat but does not participate in it and so he's always kind of on the outside and uh, he, he doesn't have that direct uh, experience that Maximus has who's uh, like all bloodied and beaten, whereas Commodus is perfectly clean. You see, even see him shirtless, like to even further emphasize he has no bruises whatsoever. He's just unscathed completely. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, it, it just, it's so such a telling moment about who he is as a person and the kind of character that he is and where he takes his pride and his self-confidence from, even though he doesn't really have anything or he didn't do anything to really earn that. He has other virtues. <laughs> that's true. Yes, like ambition. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, everyone's favorite. <laughs> well, so, so why don't we move into lessons? Cause there's still, there's tons of stuff to talk about. Um, but yeah, we can move into the context of like, so, so yeah. So what lessons are we going to take away from gladiator? Uh, and maybe I'll start actually because Thomas, what you you brought up there, um, the the very long act one. I've realized that I really like movies that have a long act one if they use it properly. And I think structurally, this movie, like start to finish, is is really great and really strong. Um, but the the act one, like you're saying, sets up these characters, sets up like desires, obstacles, fears, all those things, points them in a direction, and then like, like we're off. We get it by the end of that that um, first act. And I was thinking about how, um, why that first act is so compelling, and it was tying into the 
one of the first thoughts I was having on watching this was like, oh, Game of Thrones saw this movie. Like, there's <laughs> there's some of that yeah. in this. Uh, we're just like, you know, the, the politics of the brother and the succession. And then the sister is very Cersei-like in a way of like, if you had been a man, you could have been a great ruler. But that sucks that we have these rules. And so now you're trapped and tortured kind of. Um, but there's just, there's so much, you know, we start with this epic battle, but there's so much um, scheming and characterization like we're talking about to understand that what, wherever this act one is headed, it's not going to be good, right? There's a, there's a sense of like ominous that's, um, ominousness that's there. And the, yeah, the political maneuvering is so compelling because you know it's going to go bad at some point. So I just really liked the design of that first act because it does all these things, like you're saying, Trisha, like, is backstory. We got it. No kids, nothing to lose. Back against the wall. Like, everything we we need to know for the rest of the movie is set up there. And then I also just want to call out the midpoint because, you know, I've, I've heard the, <laughs> the Maximus, you know, speech of, like, I am Maximus Decimus, blah, 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 husband to a murdered uncle or, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and so, I'd like, I'd heard it so many times that I was like, okay, great. But when you feel it, when, like, he takes off the mask and he reveals and, like, suddenly everything that's been happening in the first half up to the moment, like, it's such a great moment. And I was like, oh, man, that yeah. is a good midpoint. So, I like to nerd out about midpoints. And that was, I get why... People like that speech now because it's very, very powerful. It's the midpoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thomas, what lesson are you going to take away from Gladiator? The big lesson I think I took away here is something I, I touched on a little bit earlier, but just the way in which, like, and, and you kind of mentioned this a little bit as well, Michael, um, but the way in which the each kind of piece of this movie, there's two parts, basically, the action and then, like, political you know, interpersonal scheming and all of this stuff. And each of those parts really like informs and improves the other in that like all the political context is not just like weird extra stuff to kill time. It, it, it like always is raising the stakes of what's happening within the action. Um, and then the presence of the action or the impending action slash combat that's coming kind of serves as this like it's the bomb under the table that of all those scenes that you like you know, even that whole first act, you're you, like, you would maybe just kind of be like, what's going on if this movie was called like a Roman soldier or something, but it's like, it's gladiator. So you, that whole first 45 minutes, you know, like a gladiator is coming at some point to like, and there's going to be fights. And so you have this very effective interplay between those two things where, um, neither element gets boring. Um, even though like, even though some of the combat in here, like, in my opinion, if you were just looking at it in like a technical formal way, like there's much more interesting ways of staging like an action scene. But because the stakes are high and the combat is what's fulfilling or like where those stakes are being resolved, we're, we're entertained by it. And then, you know, those are the moments that kind of like create the suspense that allow us to not get bored by, you know, the exposition about sen the Senate or something like that. Yeah. And it's simple, but necessary to do in a movie like this where you can't vary the kind of action sequence you're going to have really, right? Like it's going to be a hand-to-hand -hand fight. It's not going to be a gunfight. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a car chase. It's not going to be any <laughs> of those things. It's going to be a hand-to-hand -hand fight with swords. But so when you have that constraint as a screenwriter, the simplest thing that you have to do is just create variation, right? So every fight has to be distinct in some way. And they do a really good job of that here where it's like, now yeah. we're going to reenact this battle and there's chariots. Now we got to fight this guy and there's tigers. Now there's this thing. Um, and it just works really well to keep each one distinct in your mind. It's like, that's when Maximus was fighting them. That's that, that's that one. Again, simple, but very well done given the constraints. Yeah. And it's something we don't always like there's a lot of action movies now where it's like John Wick is cool to watch because he's going to look cool doing the action. Like that's the mm -hmm. whole like that's what sells that those films or something like that. And I feel like that's kind of been the trend more recently. But there's a whole nother piece of cinema where it's like 
you know, in a Western, you can have two guys just, there's only one gunshot. You have two guys stand there for like five minutes and then it can be the most intense thing ever because like you've had 45 minutes of setup for that and you know, it's coming the entire time. Uh, so it, it creates both suspense and then like a really intense climax when those things do come. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I think this, this movie is a great illustration of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you, you can infuse meaning to the actions such that a simple action can be the most compelling thing ever. And that's, yeah, uh, you know, I guess it's hard to do, but it's frustrating that the lesson that is often <laughs> yes. learned is, is the... Make it mean something. <laughs> Make it mean yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> That's my lesson. <laughs> that's, you know. that's the best lesson. <laughs> Another thought I was having just there, if uh, you guys weren't here for this, but Trisha and, and the Thelma and Louise episode, again, Ridley Scott, I'm seeing so many parallels with Thelma and Louise and Gladiator. But basically you, you talked about how in Thelma and Louise there was this kind of um, structure of you, you see them in the car, they're talking about things, updating us essentially on like how they're feeling about like where they are in their character journey. And then they stop somewhere and then something happens. But each time they stop somewhere, it has meaning because we've just had a car scene where they've like told us where they are in their journey and what they're wanting. And then after the thing happens and you rob the bank, well, now we're in a new car scene. And so there was the, a similar structure here happening with the gladiator fights and kind of what you're saying, Thomas, of this, like, you have the fight that is a point of action. It has meaning. It changes the things outside of the gladiator ring. Those things have meaning and up the stakes and then change the meaning for the next. And they just keeps this like back and forth cadence that I think is really powerful. And good. Yeah. Tom, I'm going to save you for last. So Trisha, what's your, what's your lesson? <laughs> Sure. I was thinking uh, about Commodus uh, and Joaquin Phoenix's performance is awesome in this. Commodus is one of these villains, though, that kind of sticks with you. And I was thinking about the design and the character. And we touched on some of it already about just like his feelings of insecurity and like feeling like, you know, he's not good enough. Um, and I think that the relationship between him and his father is, you know, really critical to this because his desire for his father to like love him and be proud of him is not a bad desire. You know, it's a really simple construction for a villain to say like, make them want a thing that's actually good, but make them want it too much. And that's what this is, right? It's a really basic thing that everybody wants. We all want a parent to be proud of us. We all want a parent to love us um, and live up to the legacy of whatever uh, that they wanted us to be. And when you take that to the most extreme point, you get this perversion of it and this like distorted vision of yourself and um, this insecurity that we see in Commodus. And so I think it's really, I just think it makes him memorable and like in a way sympathetic and interesting because his desire is not like power, power, rule Rome, everyone bow down to me. Um, that's not as relatable as like, I want my dad to, I wish my dad had loved me. Um, and so his desire is sympathetic, but obviously twisted. But the virtues that I was joking about earlier where he's like, but I'm good at other things. I mean, the movie shows us that, right? Like he actually is kind of good at other things. He's, he can read people. He's pretty smart about stuff and he needs to be kind of a dangerous villain. Um, otherwise we won't care if Maximus defeats him or not. He needs to be dangerous. He, we need to see that he's a danger to Rome. And so the scheming that we see going on when he's just like worried about the Senate and, you know, trying to manipulate the people around him, that in itself, it's important for him to not be like a bumbling idiot. He has to be good at things. Um, so he has to want something that's relatable and understandable. And he also has to have some skills and talents and virtues of his own um, in order to be a compelling villain. And so he has both of those things. And then you have this killer performance by Joaquin Phoenix. And I'm scared. Like, And also he needs to die. So by the end of it, I'm totally with you. <laughs> right. It's definitely one of, like, I usually am not happy when anyone dies in a movie because, you know, life is precious and all that stuff. But, like, watching him die was like, yes, yeah. kill him. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was very satisfying. Well, and really critically, he doesn't win that fight fair, right? right. I mean, he doesn't win it at all. Right. But 
he doesn't play that fight fair. If he had like, if it had even been closer to a fair fight, first of all, Maximus would have destroyed him instantly. So there's a practical thing going on there where he stabs him in the lung. But if he had fought fair, I think that just that final treachery of like, I'm doing it for show, right? But it's not real. It's a, that entertainment piece again, but it isn't the reality of what's actually happening. Um, I think also it's just like, he's got to die. <laughs> it just <laughs> yeah. makes, uh, just to your point, it makes it that much sweeter when the treachery, someone who is uh, false and dishonest and cowardly um, meets their end. Yeah. yeah, that's also what I like about him a lot. Like you, as you said, Trisha, there's, there's a certain sympathy to his character in the sense that you can relate to his initial motivation. But I also like that they didn't go as they do a lot nowadays with the I'm misunderstood and I actually have good motivations, but I take it too far and now I'm killing innocents. You know, that kind of villainous direction. Yep. But I like that, that Commodus has some genuinely bad character traits as well that also make him really unpredictable and actually dangerous in the perception of others that he's not just a misunderstood little boy at heart who wants his daddy's approval but he also is genuinely uh like maybe prideful or uh delusional in or like grandiose and um he he has he just has some genuinely bad traits that also define yeah. his characters and that add to his uh, the complexity, I think, of his, uh, of him as a villain, which, uh, yeah, that's, I think, I agree that he's one of the more memorable villains in any movie, basically. So, uh, yeah, it's just uh, a great character all around. The scene where he's um, got his arm around his nephew mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he's telling that little story, uh, which is so clearly not about what he says it's about, but um, he's telling that little story to his sister, um, about the treachery among people and antiquity or whatever against an emperor is it, it, that scene needs to be horrifying and tense. Like we need to understand the stakes. Would he kill his own nephew? Yes, he definitely would kill his own nephew. So again, going back to your point, Tom, he has to actually be dangerous and have genuinely mm -hmm. like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I think dangerous is a good way to. <laughs> I was gonna say menace, it. misanthropy, or something like that, but he's yeah, he's vicious, maybe. Or... Yeah, ruthless. Mm, yeah, he needs to be genuinely ruthless, and we need to absolutely buy that—that that he would hurt mm -hmm. people that he even really cares about just to get what he wants. Yeah, you really feel the tension in those moments where he's like, he's like wavering on the edge of like, you know, I could just kill Maximus right now but like he's swayed by the crowd you really feel it's not like like every time that happens because there's kind of like multiple moments every time i'm like genuinely scared that he might just go through with it um and like you know that that can't really happen yet at those points because it's a lot of movie mm -hmm. left but like i think his danger and that threat is in the character is a big part of what sells the tension of those uh, of those mm -hmm. moments yeah well, that three dimensionality that, that you know, because they're all talking about here, where you understand what he's thinking in those moments, right? He's not just like pausing and you're like, just like throw your thumb up or down, but like you understand all the things and the scheming that's happening. To, and and Joaquin Phoenix's performance is really good. I understand why people um, were like, he's a good actor after, after this movie. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Tom, what's your lesson? Yeah, I think my main lesson from Gladiator is one that we, we, we've we talked about a lot right now, it, or by now, it's the just the way it includes action and spectacle in a way that also makes the performative element of it matter and just the way it is communicated and not just as a tool to reach a certain outcome in an exciting way. Um, I can't really think of any movies that do it quite this well there's there's probably some others but um yeah i think gladiator has always been my go-to example to discuss or study uh meaningful spectacle and uh meaningful action meaningful violence and just the way you can make all those elements matter on multiple different uh levels of a story yeah the hunger games 
borrows a lot thematically from Gladiator, yeah. obviously, mm. um, and other stories like this. And the book is about is more about this kind of theme that we've been talking about of like the performative aspects of leadership mm -hmm. and and combat specifically and like what that what violence as entertainment means. Um so anyway, not as not quite as um <laughs> historical is what I'm gonna go with. <laughs> <laughs> Gladiator. Well, may, maybe as historical as this movie, although, sure. depending, I mean, based on what I was reading about. Fair <laughs> point. <laughs> but yeah, to Tom, to your point, there's there mm -hmm. there's a lot of little like details in like that that um, set piece where uh, we talked about already, where the 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 bat they're redoing the battle and it turns in their favor. Like there's those little bits where um, Maximus is like, we need to stay together. And it do, the movie doesn't like make a huge deal out of it, but like he says that and some of the people stay together and some of them don't. And then we just see like all the ones who don't die. And it's mm -hmm. like it, it's like that little piece, which is like a subplot of this larger piece of action, just kind of helps communicate and reinforce like, oh, Maximus kind of like knows what he's doing and like he what he says makes a difference. And it is that which makes them, you know, able to succeed. Um, but it's just like you know, embedded in there within the action in a way that it, it's not like drawing a huge arrow pointing to it, but it just plays out as yeah. part of the part of the scene. I, I also love that little moment. It's right at the beginning of that battle where Maximus asks if anyone has served in the army before. And then someone off screen mentions quite subtly like, oh, yeah, I have served under you in that place. And you don't even see who it is and it's mm. not really brought up again, but I I don't know why I thought that was just such an interesting little detail, but yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's also just so much like texture and the world and like, you, mm. you really believe yeah. in this story world that has been created and yeah, little details like that can go a long way to, to that. And yeah. It's, I think Ridley Scott in general is so good at that kind of world building and inserting all these little, almost throwaway lines and little details that seem unnecessary, but do end up building to the overall immersive aspect of it all. It's just uh, really fascinating to me. The little motif of like Maximus like grabbing the dirt and just like rubbing it around. Mm. It's little things like that that are like so simple, but add to the physicality of the world in a way that like, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's iconic to the point of parody, the like hand in the wheat kind of shot. But like, there's something about that that is almost like, archetypal in a sense where like it's just mm -hmm. lodged straight into my brain the first time i saw it and you see it re like crop up like everywhere um but it has that sort of like i don't know there's a physical physicality to the world that connects you to the character and his experience yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i like i hate that motif like I've, I've seen it in so many movies of like hands through grain and i'm like how great can your hand rubbing over grain be like everyone like it's got to be a handheld shot from a low angle and the sunset is right. this flaring lens mm -hmm. but in this movie i was like oh like i get it and there it's it, there's meaning to it ascribed to it within yeah. this movie and it's also kind of helping to set up this kind of afterlife thread that is throughout that also makes his death and the end feel like a victory hashtag thumb on louise similarities mm. spoiler alert <laughs> so yeah that, it felt earned in, in this uh, yeah, yeah movie. it sets up so much with just those two opening shots you open with the hand in the wreath and it's warm and it feels homely and then immediately we cut to maximus standing in the snow in the cold and it's more bluish the screen and just in those two shots there's already so much that's being communicated about what he wants where he's from and where he is now and what he's looking back to and uh, yeah I, I i agree it's 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 a tired trope at this point but um it does work quite well here i think i'm not sure if yeah. gladiator was actually the first to do it or if it's been it might be a tired trope because of this movie i think yeah yeah, yeah. well and just really quickly Thinking about the tactile, like the texture of the world, it's also a big part of it is the sound design, I think. Like mm. it just really transports you there. That that battle in Germania where you can hear like the horses and the armor clashing and the swords. And, and I just feel like there's so much. This was 
uh, nominated for an Oscar. I don't know if it won. I think it won for Best Sound. Sound mixing. Yeah, it should have. Because it just does so much where you feel like the metal and the earth and the everything just coming together. It feels like cr- crunchy in the way that <laughs> Alex would say if he were here. Yes. Not yeah. bouncy. Not bouncy. No bounce detected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I mean, yeah. So there's, I think we could talk for a very long time about all the things that Gladiator does because it really is great. I'm, I'm, as I said, very happy that I've been forced to finally close out this hole in, in my filmography. Uh, and kind of like you were saying, Tom, I think it's one I will return to frequently to study lots of different things. The structural, like you're saying, that the action and how to infuse it with meaning. Uh, yeah, all these things we've talked about are good movie. Thumbs up. Thumbs up for Michael. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I could feel the tension there too. And that was, yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So before we wrap up, uh, why don't we quickly go around and say what we're what we're watching and what we might recommend to people? Uh, I'm going to do it in reverse order. So Tom, why don't you start us off? It's been a while, but um, on the topic of Ridley Scott, uh, a while ago, Thomas and I revisited uh, Kingdom of Heaven. And in particular, the director's cut, which I think is a wildly different movie from the one that released in theaters back when it came out. And uh, yeah, I think that's it, it. I wouldn't say it's better than Gladiator. Definitely not. Probably on all the technical levels, Gladiator still wins. But for some reason, I might like Kingdom of Heaven more. It's one that if, if you'd ask me on any day, like which one would you which one do you want to watch? Like I might lean towards Kingdom of Heaven uh, because it feels slightly more adventurous in some way. And whereas Gladiator is more like this Shakespearean tragedy that feels a bit more heavy handed at times. But yeah, Kingdom of Heaven, that's one for me that I think is really underappreciated, both in the context of Ridley Scott's filmography as well as in uh, film history in general, which yeah, there's just there's so many interesting themes on religion and morality and especially the kind of personal principles versus a more altruistic uh, collective goal. And uh, typical for Ridley Scott is great world building, great music, great sounds and textures. And uh, so, yeah, that that's one I'd... I, it's my go-to recommendation for movies uh, for people who... Uh, because it's it's also one that, in my experience, at least a lot of people have missed, even though they like f- movies like Gladiator and the big swords and sandals stuff. For some reason, a lot of them haven't seen Kingdom of Heaven or only saw the theatrical cuts. But um, if you're someone like that, I definitely recommend check out the director's cut as well. It's um, it, it's uh, to me, it's an amazing movie. Yeah, I I. Had never seen it, so I'm one of those people and was just looking up in the cast mm. even. It's like like so Orlando Bloom, Ava Green, Liam Neeson, Michael Sheen, David Thewlis. Like, that's an impressive lineup. Lots of other people, too. So, all right. That's definitely some great performances in there. Nice. Awesome. All right, cool. Trisha, what about you? What have you been watching? Yeah, so I decided to watch this movie from 1990 called Bad Influence, uh, which is a Rob Lowe and James Spader thriller i'm gonna go with that is a uh, directed by curtis wow. hansen and written by david kep um first of all love david kep uh just what a i could talk for ages about david kep uh and and the literally 50 movies that he's written i like counted it the other day and i was like oh it's you've written 50 movies and some of the greatest of all times and then some of the others that are just like i didn't know you made this Um, And Bad Influence is one of those, but uh, it's about, um, you know, Rob Lowe plays this like sort of nameless, charming um, guy who kind of lives on the fringes and is like a pickup artist and like just kind of lives fast and loose. And James Spader plays this really buttoned up uh, corporate dude. And it kind of becomes, you know, this uh, like influential, like masculine sort of Rob Lowe constantly challenging James Spader to just like act out and um, be more of a man and take control of his life. If it sounds like Fight Club, 
it is very, very much like Fight Club. Um, it is very interesting. Uh, anyway, really, really liked it. It's got some super messed up kind of haunting set pieces in it. Uh, and it's just this like, yeah, kind of thriller, psychological thriller from 1990. So um, if you are interested more in like violence and masculinity and uh, what that means, definitely bad influence is one to check out. And I had never even heard of it before I decided to check it out. Interesting. I feel like bad influence could be the name of Fight Club. That would actually be a totally fine <laughs> title swap. Well, like, so there, there isn't the kind of twist that uh, you get in Fight Club, but there are some jaw-dropping revelations. Um, so I, it, I don't know. Like, I didn't really know where it was going. Um, it, ha it takes some very extreme twists and turns that I really... The thing is, the thing about David Kemp's movies is just like, stuff happens. Lots of stuff happens, and it's usually real cinematic, and he just really goes for it all the time um, in a way that I can't help but appreciate. So, yeah, yeah, bad influence. Nice. Cool. All right, Thomas, what about you? I am very into, this is going in a completely different direction from the other two recommendations, but I'm very into Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal right now. Nathan Fielder is back on HBO and he's concocted a new incredible world where he gets these people who have some kind of situation in their life. The, the, the pilot is about a guy who has been lying about the fact that he has a master's degree and he only has a bachelor's and he's too afraid to tell his trivia friends. And so to help him work through this situation, Nathan Fielder recreates the bar where he goes to trivia, hires all these extras, and they tirelessly rehearse every aspect of how this situation will go down where he confesses. And then they like actually film the confession. But there's all kinds of layers to it because, of course, Nathan Fielder is interrogating his own insecurities. And he's been rehearsing things these whole, this whole time as well. And it's a very bizarre exploration of like reality television and documentary, but also like weirdly about anxiety and how we think about like social interactions ourselves and how we could try to control the outcomes in situations by rehearsing things mentally or trying to like know how things will go. Um, and it's, I, I love it so much. It's, it's fascinating. Often like it, it's a different kind of um, screenwriting, but I often am just like in awe of how they must have managed to piece together a story out of like these really bizarre situations where they're just drawing from like nonfiction footage that they're collecting and kind of like you can tell having to like evolve the story based on what is happening with the participants and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, it's 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 worth checking out. If you can bear the awkwardness, it's it's a very uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not for people who who don't have a tolerance for any level of cringe. <laughs> I feel like that's my immediate thought and fear is I don't, like that sounds really fascinating and cool, and I'm getting anxious just hearing you talk about it. I'm like I feel like I'm <laughs> I would need to like plan how I was going to watch it even, and like that's probably not the like you know, the lesson that I should be taking away. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you can get Nathan in to, to help you rehearse you <laughs> yeah. know a scenario Locking where you can it, yeah. watch the show yeah. <laughs> that would, yeah, that'd be meta that's cool <laughs> Michael what have you been watching so I started uh, Only Murders in the Building the, Yay, the Hulu show welcome thank you it's a really interesting show so yeah so it's on Hulu Steve Martin Martin Short and Selena Gomez which is like three people that I never would have expected to be in a thing. Uh, and it's, you know, about like true crime podcasters, but also they're trying to solve an actual murder. I don't know. It's, it's a, a weird mishmash of things that I'm interested in for a long time. I was, I was in true crime and podcasts and was writing a script about it. And then was like, this is too dark. And emotionally, I'm always afraid I'm going to get murdered. So I need to stop listening and engaging with true crime stuff but also the morality of like entertainment again, right? Like turning people's actual suffering into entertainment. So it's interesting watching the show kind of deal with some of that, but like through the lens of Steve Martin and Martin's short comedy. comedy. <laughs> and it feels both <laughs> old and charming and old and uh, and new and interesting and new and hmm. But as I'm watching it more, I feel like it's starting to coalesce into a thing. So... It's been just a really, 
fascinating watch. Uh, and so I'm almost at the end of season one. I look forward to season two, which I think was nominated for a bunch of Emmys recently and stuff. So, uh, and it's fun to see like Steve Martin and Martin Short again, because I grew up with them and I'm like, oh, I'm glad they're still, still around doing stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So only murders in the building. Awesome. Well, this has been super fun. Thank you guys so much. Uh, like I said, there's so much to talk about with Gladiator, and I think we only like skim the surface, but it I really appreciate just so much about it, and I'm glad that I can have a have a nice solid reference for it and, and go back and check it out all the all, all the time, potentially moving forward, because I've been wanting to watch it again, which is like a, a rare thing. Um but uh, yeah, so before we wrap up, uh, Tom and Thomas, where can people find you? Where can they watch and listen to all of your things? Do your spiel. I'm Thomas Flight on YouTube and everywhere else. Uh, and uh, and then I co-host the podcast Cinema of Meaning with, uh, with Tom, who uh, we have lots of great discussions about uh, movies like Gladiator and uh, Tom mentioned um, Kingdom of Heaven. We talked about that a while ago and had a very interesting discussion. Similar to Gladiator, it kind of has these like underlying themes that are mm-hmm. uh, very thought provoking. Um, but yeah, Thomas Flight everywhere and Cinema of Meaning. You guys recently did an episode on Jurassic Park. I thought you did a fantastic job. Really enjoyed that one. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good one. Yeah. It's great. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. If you like our show, you'll definitely like it. You should check it out. You definitely will. And Tom, what about you? So yeah, I'm Tom. I run the channel like Stories of Old, in which I make video essays that really basically do what we also do on the podcast, but in a more structured, uh, structured format. Uh, I really look at the connections between movies and philosophies and ideas and the way uh, and especially the how of how movies connect with us and give meaning to our lives, basically, and uh, the way we connect with them on that more personal level. And um, so, yeah, that's um, my channel. And then, of course, there's the um, the podcast with Thomas, uh, Cinema of Meaning. Your channel, Tom, like stories of old, is one of the first ones that I became a patron of because I remember I did. I know, my... I remember because <laughs> <laughs> I did my dark dark night video, and there was all this stuff that I wanted to talk about, but that didn't like make sense for like my channel or what I was doing. And then you released a video, and I was like, ah, this is like this is it. This is saying all the things I wanted to say and saying it better than I would have, and I mm-hmm. got very excited. So I felt so validated in that moment <laughs> because less lessons of the screenplay was kind of my. Uh, one of the inspirations for my channel and then I think back then I was still really small I only had like a couple of thousand subscribers and then suddenly your channel popped up on my Patreon page and I was like what? (laughs) I remember actually I don't know if you remember this but I asked for your advice at one point I think it was either before I started my channel or shortly after and I sent you a message on Facebook Oh, wow. Uh, did, just I, did I respond? A really, I hope so. Yeah, you did. Okay. It was kind of a general answer. and But the funny thing is, uh, I basically asked something along the lines of, how do I get popular? <laughs> and you <laughs> you a- answered with, uh, I don't know, post it around on Reddit or try this or that. But I remember the funny thing is like a couple of years later, I got that exact same question from someone else who asked it to me and I kind of passed along Aww. your answer. So I felt like I had gone full circle. It's the so, circle uh, of life. Yeah. Uh-huh. The circle of YouTube. <laughs> yes. The YouTube video says. That's, yeah, that's awesome. That's heartwarming. <laughs> well, I'm really glad we could all be here now to do this together. Yeah, it was fun. Kind of surreal for me because I listened to Beyond the Screen play a lot and... <laughs> I'm not sure how you listen to a podcast, but when I, whenever I listen to a conversational podcast, I kind of imagine myself inside the conversation and I think <laughs> of my own arguments and I kind of imagine myself being there. And now, now obviously it's here actually happening here. Yeah. <laughs> now you can listen back to this and, th- and <laughs> rebut your own uh, <laughs> statements. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we'll have to do it again sometime and get the mm-hmm. others in yes. here also, because they would love to be part of this conversation as well. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, To quickly wrap up, like I said, uh, next episode, we'll be talking about 
uh, Alien. Uh, we want to take a moment to say thank you to our patrons for making the show possible. Uh, thank you to our producer, Vince Major, and our editors, Caleb Berg, Graham Harther, Eric Snyder. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Tom Vanderlinden, and Tom's Flight. Uh, check out the show notes for Twitter's links and all the stuff. Uh, and we will see you in the next episode. Tom and Thomas, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much Bye, for everybody. having us.